From the Mecca Mormonism, this is Heart of the Matter, where we are learning how to be Christians in the age of fulfillment. I'm your host, Sean McCraney. Uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we seek you and thank you. We recognize your presence in this uh, place, in this world, in this uh, universe, and we just pray that we will uh, tap into uh, your will and your calling to us, and that we will uh, not lose faith as we walk through this uh, difficult, strange life. We pray your spirit will be with us tonight. Bless uh, Seth and Wendy and Mary and Mags and uh, Delaney. Delaney is back with us, Lord. We pray that you'll uh, watch over them and bless them and help the viewers at home who are uh, uh, tuning in that your spirit of truth will speak. This is a This is a wrap-up, complex topic, but we pray that we'll be able to get to it with some truth and forget the rest. So we love you and we seek you. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, got some really cool stuff coming out in the near future you're going to be pretty stoked about. And uh, one of them, which I hope you will appreciate, is we're going to have the TVAR version of the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, ready. Um, I, I, had, I have to see what the formatting will be. It's going to be available uh, online through probably print on demand, the Synoptic Gospels. It's the first phase of them, which is the biggest phase, and the hardest th thing to put together is the first phase. But you'll have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John available to you. If you've been a supporter of the TVAR, uh, we will s get that to you for free uh, in the future. But uh, we're just wrapping it up. I really only have about... 80 verses left out of, a, I don't know how many, there's a thousand plus in Matthew. And then we're going to wrap that up. But uh, expect to see that in the future. And then we'll continue to move forward. I'm going to do the book of Revelation next, just so we can get that out of the way. And, uh, and then we're narrowing it down. I think we're going to have the first run through done uh, within a year and a half to two years more. That will put us at about the three year mark. And then the second phase, which is putting the whole thing together with the end notes and everything else will probably take another two. So we're going to be close on our five-year plan. Uh, nevertheless, the Synoptic Gospels and the first distribution of the TVAR will be ready probably within two to three weeks. So keep that in mind. Just wanted to let you know. Also, we have a few other surprises that are headed your way that uh, I guarantee will be a blessing to you uh, if you're able to get a hold of them. And stay tuned and we'll let you know all about it. So <clears throat> sit with me now. We're going to wrap up some things. Uh, you know I've been gnawing on the Trinity and trying to get my mind around it for years. I have actually begged God, tell me, show me, reveal yourself to me. Help me understand the Trinity. And uh, asked, I've studied scripture, I've debated with great minds uh, on the Trinity and, and argued against it and had numerous discussions about it. Wednesday morning on May 6th, 2020, a light came on. And I'm reasonably satisfied now with how I see the makeup of God today. Six, six days later, this was last Wednesday. So Wednesday morning, I'm sitting at this table because I can't go out and work anymore. And I'm overlooking Fourth West in Salt Lake City. And it kind of came into view. It wasn't a revelation of new information at all. I'm not claiming any kind of prophecy or anything like that. But it was my understanding of old information that kind of helped gel the thing together in my mind relative to God's makeup. And so I want to share that with you tonight um, for whatever it's worth. You can agree with it. You can disagree with it. It's okay. This is how I will, I think from now on with maybe a few minor adjustments, see the makeup of God. It's not exhaustive or complete. I'm sure as God is really difficult to try to completely understand, you know, but uh, it is where I stand today and probably won't shift too much much from it for uh, the rest of my life. Uh, I think it's natural, first of all, and you've heard this before, for human beings, especially in religious 
with religious mindsets, I think it's really natural for us to seek concrete um, explanations of things. Perfection, we want perfection. Um, as human beings, we want to know things in religious realms. I know the church is true is what the Mormons say on their testimony meetings. And I know God is a Trinity. And I want to be told that this is how you baptize. This is who can be baptized uh, and, and, and things like that, right? And so it's part of our carnal nature, understand that, to want that certainty because certainty brings to us peace and comfort. And it allows us when we have certainty in one area of our life to move on to other areas that are less certain and deal with the stress of living in that realm of uncertainty. And so when we can take something as big as God and make God certain in every way possible, then it's very beneficial to us, right? We see the innate need of human beings to have certainty in the history and development of Western philosophy. And I've talked about this before, but in a very simplified form, not exhaustive, but for argument's sake, just suppose that there are two Greek philosophers and there, these two philosophers did exist and each of them are saying, I have the one certain truth that everyone needs to know. One described the permanence or stasis of things. His name was Parmenides and Parmenides said, sort of like Plato uh, also, talked, also talked about, also talked about, <laughs> Plato also, also talked about, and that is there's a permanent form fixed. There are rules and laws that don't deviate and the form is permanent. So Parmenides discussed this and the other guy, he said, no, everything's in a state of flux and everything is always constantly changing. His name was Heraclitus. And uh, we can see right off the bat, looking at uh, Greek philosophy, this idea of concrete, this form is true, and there is nothing to challenge it. And then we have, uh, and which would represent the Trinity. This is what God is. It's true, nothing can challenge it. And then we have Heraclitus pop up and say, no, I, I don't think so. I think that there are, there's wiggle room and things are constantly in a state of flux. And that just, that just destroys everybody who wants the certainty. So um, Heraclitus is the guy who said, you can never step in the same river twice. I was sitting with my grandsons and family the other day at the side of a river and uh, I was thinking about Heraclitus and my feet were in this freezing water and I took my foot out and then I said, okay, there's the river and I put my foot in and I took my foot out and I put my foot in and Heraclitus is right because that river between me taking my foot out and putting it back in again had changed. How? Well, the fish were in different places and the rocks and the sand had been moved to different places and the levels were at different places and Heraclitus is saying you can never be in the same river twice. So when you bring in that state of flux and uncertainty into our minds as humans, you know, if you had that in your relationship, in your marriage, you don't know if it's going to last or end and you're in this, it drives you nuts, right? If your health, if one minute you're dying, the doctor says you're going to be dead tomorrow and then tomorrow comes and the next doctor says you're, gonna, you're not going to die, this state of flux rips us apart. So we have to have certainty. And it really comes into play when it comes to God. So borrowing from this model, I want to speak to you what I now believe is um, an approach to understanding the ontology or makeup of God. And I'm going to call this a timeline, what am I calling it, of God among men. A timeline of God among men, men and women. 
So look back quickly with me to Plato. We've had Parmenides and we've had Heraclitus each giving these truths and saying this is the truth. Plato comes along. He introduces Socrates, who gave us, you know, uh, the unexamined life is not worth living. And then from there, from Plato, we have uh, Aristotle and he comes and he systematizes everything. Aristotle is the great categorizer of thought and science and, and species and everything. He, he categorized it to kind of give us this encyclopedia of knowledge. And people were like, uh, Aristotle has the great way of understanding the world. And uh, years unfold. And there's more philosophers who step up and say, wait a minute, I want to challenge this thought. And Descartes comes along and he gives us Cartesian thought. And then, not, not then, you know, this is spread out among many, but we have, you know, uh, Kant, Kant, Kant and Kantian philosophy. And we have David Hume and we have all these people coming in and saying, no, this is the way. And now this is it. And even... You know, all the way out to our day and these other philosophers say, no, you got to see it this way because they know that people like uh, concrete thinking. Well, along comes this guy named Hegel and people hate Hegel because he was diabolical in some of his thoughts, but they also hate him because Hegel's ideas were taken by Karl Marx and Engels and, and, and they were formed into what's called uh, dialectical materialism not going to even go there, but because he had the mindset that helped Marx and Engels, uh, people said, well, you know, he's bad. And plus he, he had some other theories that were wrong, but Hegel's insights were really, really important. And I'm simply going to use the basis of Hegel's thought about concrete ideas, not being the way to pursue the understanding, the makeup of God. I want to strip ourselves away from that, if possible, and I want to tell you why. So instead of us as Christians reading the Bible and trying to come up with this unassailable approach to his makeup by using different passages sewn together to create what I call a chimera God, um, Hegel said, listen, let's stop as philosophers trying to come up with the one uh, paramedic idea and let's start saying all the ideas contribute to a better understanding of what, philo what the philosophy is. So I'm going to borrow from Hegel's thought. Someone else came along, it wasn't Hegel, and they named what Hegel was describing as the um, uh, thesis the dialect is called the thesis and then the antithesis and then the synthesis of an idea. Hegel in his, he never used those words, but he came up with this. And so it, it, what it works like is one philosophy steps forward and says, I'm the best. Uh, that's the thesis. Another philosophy steps forward and says, no, I don't agree with you. You're wrong, and they fight and battle it out. And those two, in the warfare between each other, create a synthesis, and that synthesis, in time, becomes the new thesis. And then when that thesis is presented, so it's as, as concrete, another thing comes along and says, no, I disagree with you. And they fight it out, and they become a new synthesis, and that synthesis over time becomes the new thesis and on and on and on so that we're never arriving at this concrete idea of what the best philosophy is, but we're saying all of them work to creating a better understanding of how to define philosophy in the first place. So there goes my computer running amok all the way away from where I was. So let me illustrate the, the dialectic of, of Hegel in sim simple terms. The thesis statement, all men are good. This is true, it's great, it's true. The antithesis to all men are good, the antithesis to it would be, all men are bad. And they fight. 
One says all men are good. One says all men are bad. They fight, fight, fight. And then they come around to the synthesis, which says some men are good and some men are bad. This is the new synthesis. In time, that becomes the new thesis. And now the thesis of some men are good, and I'm saying men meaning men and women, and some men are bad, is challenged. And then it's, let's say that is challenged by some men are good and bad. And so some men are good and bad challenges, some men are good and some men are bad, and they fight it out. And, and then we come to the new synthesis. All men are both good and bad. And then that becomes a new synthesis and on and on and on. Now, my point in explaining this to you is to show that historically we have, as a Christian body, approached the makeup of God by claiming this is true. We had a council of men create that for us. This is true. I've given you the basis for why they did it. They wanted the political unrest to cease in Constantine's empire. And so they all got together and they said, okay, we're going to give the one definition. And we know from history, the victors are get their philosophy perpetuated through the years. And so they were the winners. And so that philosophy or that ontology of God has been perpetuated forward by people as the truth. And it was Parmenides, uh, uh, Parmenides all over again. So this is what dawned on me that Wednesday morning. And we can either continue to promote, argue for the single right way to understand God that goes from the beginning of everything all the way out to today, and it must be embraced in that way, all the way as the only way, or perhaps we can see the makeup of God as a continued revelation of himself who at times is monotheistic, one only, oneness, at other times, apparently Trinitarian, at other times potentially modalist, at other times binitarian, and all the, these, these views in scripture are being supported of those things. That's why we have whole groups that break from Trinitarianism and call themselves oneness Pentecostals. They're not dumb people. They understand the scripture and they've pulled the passages that don't support Trinitarianism. I think God is smiling through all this. I think he's like, are they going to love each other? When will they choose to love each other? I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to say in my scripture, I am one God, one being of three persons. I'm not going to say that because that's not what I am. I'm that way sometimes, and there's passages that might sometimes support that, but there's passages that will support that I'm just one, and that there's no other but me. And there's passages that support that the one has become another. And, and you have to say, well, how does that work? And so what we've done is we've created this trinity, not realizing that God potentially, this is my postulation to you is that he's used all these forms to reveal himself. And I see that happening in the timeline of God um, uh, toward man. Delaney, will you grab that and pick, put it here for me? We are changing and going to the whiteboard. No, not that one. It sinks on me. This one it will hold. Thank you. Thank you. I like how you hide from the camera. <laughs> All right. So, 
I want to look at that with you. Look into the Bible, specifically the Old Testament, in the ti- a timeline of God among men. We have this representation of God. Now, I know the Trinitarians and others will try to make all sorts of other representations, and we've talked about some of those. But Genesis 1-2 says God uh, has a spirit. And Genesis 1-3 says God has a voice or speaks. We know these things about this one God in the Old Testament. We know from the great Shema that God is one. There is no others before him. Dang, get from me. We know that God is jealous, or as our kids say, jelly, and that he is merciful. And scripture also calls this God terrible. Did you know that? It does. It calls him that. It says that he is gracious. He, he's, I'm just going to put gracious. He's greater than man. He is a consuming fire. That is a description of this one God. Okay? And that he is angry every day. That's Psalm 711. Uh, 711. He's angry. And Psalm 711 says every day. All right? And he's generous with the righteous. I'm not going to add that. So we have these descriptions of God is. Right? We don't have in this description anything about the three We don't have anything in this description about Father, Him being the Father uh, to the Son. We don't have any of these Trinitarian notions going on. We have that He's one and that He's a spirit and that He speaks. And he's He's a breath and He speaks, but He doesn't have a mouth or vocal cords. So this is a mysterious God. This God of consuming fire could not dwell in the hearts of human beings from the fall forward. With Adam and Eve, that God was with them, in the cool of the garden, walking with them. But once the fall occurred, this God does not fit in to the inside of a human being very well. Maybe there's exceptions to that, because with God, there's almost always exceptions. But he, he's not in with them because it would create annihilation. Uh, He fathered a nation through a man named Abraham and then Isaac and then Jacob. And that consisted of the children of Israel. And he gave them the law and he promised, I'll be your God and you'll be my people. And the Holy Spirit, his Holy Spirit, which brooded upon the waters. Remember, God is described as spirit there. That spirit prompted the prophets to speak by inspiration and reveal God's will. He was not called the with the definite article, the Father, with a capital F, anywhere in the Old Testament. And that's represented by these lines. Old Testament. Never is he called the Father. We say God's eternal, he's a Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and he's one God of three persons. Never in all of the Old Testament is he called with a definite article, the Father, capital T, with capital F. In fact, if you want to hear something really interesting to make it even more difficult, is the only place where we read the Father with a capital F in the Old Testament is Isaiah 9-6. And what's Isaiah 9-6 talking about? Jesus. It's talking about the um, uh, prophetic utterance of Jesus. And you're going to recognize it because Handel put it to music. And it says, for unto us a child is born and unto us a, a son is given and the government shall be upon his shoulder... And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. The only time, and then it says the Prince of Peace, the only time in the Old Testament where the definite article the and Father, capital F, is used is when it's describing prophetically the coming of Jesus, the Son. So you want to get things all mixed up, just bring that into the whole picture who say that the the three are separate and distinct and and are not the same. Here we have in the Old Testament, by the Holy Spirit through Isaiah, calling Jesus the Father with a capital F. That stuff keeps me up at night 
when I have been trying to make it all work. All right. The Trinitarian doctrine, therefore, was not applicable going back to the beginning, even though they try to say it was. And they do that because of that concreteness that they want to bring in so that the thinking's done and people can move on and just accept it. Um, God was about, however, to become more like a trinity than any other time that I can see in Scripture. And that was uh, out of love for the world. Now, people say, God doesn't change. He has always been a trinity. He doesn't change. And I would just say to you, you're wrong. And you're wrong because if God doesn't change, then was there a Jesus who was God with us in flesh at the beginning? No, there wasn't. Jesus was made of a woman under the law, says the scripture. He was made in the likeness of men. Made. So Jesus, God with us, born of a woman, was a change in the makeup of God. You have to admit that. So when you say God doesn't change, I agree with you when it comes to his characteristics and his consuming fire and what he is relative to light and love and goodness and all his characteristics. But he does change in physical manifestations to us. And that's what leads us to the problem of trying to assign a trinity going all the way backward, is that we're trying to assign these physical attributes to an eternal God and it doesn't work. So this change would begin in God, of God, at the incarnation of Christ. So this is Old Testament God. And he became, listen, the article Father when, when he extended himself into a person called the Son. Now we have two persons going on here. Now we have part, at least divinity going on, because we know that the Son was God, and we know that the Father is God, but we have God expressing himself in a different way that was not expressed here. And so we can say, well, or once we have a monotheistic God of one, suddenly we now have at least a bitheistic expression of God that he sent his Son. Isn't that radical? We note that the Son, according to Luke, is the product of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. It does not say that the Father overshadowed Mary. It says that the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary and she bore a son. So we have a problem there with the whole uh, Trinity thing going on too. But nevertheless, we still have two persons, don't we? And when we read about this in the New Testament, we say, wow, that supports the Trinity. That supports it, right? This is the one God entering into time and space. And in doing that, he could dwell among human beings. This is a line. This is heaven. This is earth. He could live with us without destroying us. That's how he did it. He did it through his son, born of a woman the fullness of God in him. And this was the beginning of the Son of God, Jesus of Nazareth, not the Word of God. That's always been there. Because remember, God speaks, going all the way here. But the Son of God, it begins here at the incarnation, in the man, Jesus of Nazareth, in an earthly form where God can relate to human beings in time and space. All right? So here in flesh, Jesus referred to Yahweh as the Father. He referred to him as his Father. He referred to him as our Father when he taught the disciples to pray, our Father which is in heaven. You see? So at the incarnation of the Son, the one God became the Father in capitals, 
and we have two of the, of the persons of the Trinity in place. After Jesus, death and resurrection, his shed blood cleared the hearts of people by faith for God to enter into them in another manifestation of himself, the Holy Spirit, or if you want to call it, um, the Spirit of Christ. And now we have the three in the one. There's not more than one God here. This is, the, this is, this is this God. Just take this and shrink it down to that, expressing himself in those ways. And we have passages that speak to these persons during this time. During this time, Old Testament is over. And now we have what we'll call the New Testament going on. And we have this happening. And so people read those passages describing this. And they say, God is the same going to here, to here. And it looks like this. But no, it looks like this before. So what we have here is Hegel's dialectic happening. Is we have a thesis statement in the Old Testament. It's confronted by an antithesis statement here in the New Testament. Is there more? There is. That's the thing that is so beautiful about this. Let me tell you what happens. After his resurrection... Jesus says to the apostles, listen to this. All authority has been given to me. That's what he says. In heaven and on earth. So suddenly we have something happening here. All authority has been given to him. That's what he says. He's in, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 21, uh, Paul says of Jesus, he's far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named and not only in this the age, but also in the age to come. He is above it all. His father has given him everything, all of it into his hands. In uh, Matthew eleven twenty seven, 27, Jesus said, all things have been handed over to me by my father. And no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son will reveal uh, him. And speaking to uh, Christians in Colossians 2.10, we read, And in him you have been made complete, and he is the head over all rule and authority. So it says. And then Peter, speaking of uh, him after his resurrection, Peter says, Sorry. You just touch it once and it flies away like a crazy bird. <laughs> Peter says in 1 Peter 3.22, Jesus, who is at the right hand of God, he's at the right hand of God. Now he's ascended, right? And, and having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers have been subjected to him. And then in Ephesians 1.20, speaking of what God the Father did in Jesus, Paul wrote, which he had brought about in Jesus when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places. For this reason, when Jesus resurrected and Thomas came and touched the wounds in his hands, Thomas bowed to him and said, my Lord and my God. Thomas never did that when Jesus was a man walking around on earth overcoming his flesh. Thomas did it once Jesus had overcome his flesh and resurrected and all things had been given to him by the father. All things, everything. That takes us to another picture, you guys. It's right here. It's Jesus. All the fullness of God dwelling in him bodily is how Paul describes him, right? I'm not saying that, that, that God doesn't exist, but, I, but from what scripture says, God exists fully in all things in Jesus to, toward human beings. In fact, scripture goes so far to say as calling this Holy Spirit now the spirit of Jesus. We're going to cover this next week. And, the, and, and, and Jesus says, I have to go away because if I don't, I can't send you the comforter. And, but if I go away, I can send you the comforter. 
So we're seeing that even a spirit emanates from Jesus, comes through Jesus, uh, that is God, filling the people who are his. But we're not done. There's still another thing that has to happen in, in the scripture that blows my mind. In his epistle to the church of Corinth, Paul is describing the resurrection. And he says that it would begin, and, uh, and then he says the following things that are so, so, so important to what happens past this point when Jesus, still part of the New Testament narrative, Jesus has, has all things given to him by his Father, right? There's another thing that happens, and it's described in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul's talking about the resurrection, and he says, But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, he's the first one to be resurrected, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. So the resurrection begins with Christ, and then the resurrection continues to happen for people at his coming, which I believe was in 70 AD. So I believe the resurrection is going on. Listen to what he says. Then comes the end. Then comes the end. That's what Paul wrote. After Jesus comes as coming, then comes the end. The end of what? The end of the former age. So when he returned, the resurrection would commence. And then comes the end of the former age. Listen, when he, Jesus, shall have delivered up the kingdom, when he, Jesus, shall have delivered up the kingdom, this is what Paul says, to God, even the Father. That's what he says happens. When he shall have put down all rule, authority, and power. For he, Jesus, must reign until he, God, has put all enemies under his feet. For he, God, has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under his feet, God has put all things under his feet. It is manifest that God is accepted of this, which did put all things under his feet. That's what Paul says. Wait. And when all things shall be subdued to him, Jesus, all things, when all things have been subdued to him, listen to this line, then shall the son also himself be subject to him that put all things under him that God may be all in all, back to this. And so we have at the end of all this, at this point in scripture at least, we have, how do you do a, we have like, like this is God, this is Jesus, this is, an inter, this is intersecting into a circle, and this is, the, this is Jesus, and this is the Holy Spirit. And it totally changes because God is all in all now. He's everything. He is over all of it. That's why I have this, by the way. Because he is, he is the center of all it. Because Jesus handed everything that he was over. All things were given to him at this point. But he handed it all back to his Father so that God could be all in all. And we now live in that world of reconciliation, which I talked about uh, last night through Jesus. And so when we look at all that, in my estimation with God now, after all these things that he's, scripture supports, he has revealed himself. He's had the victory over everything through his son at this phase of the game. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ is sent now to all who believe. And God is calling and bringing all people to him. In the meantime, everything was given to Jesus at the end of that age, even so much that he said to his own apostles in that day, everything's been given to me. But then we read at the resurrection, everything will be given back from Jesus, back to his father and God will be all in all. And we have an ontology of God displayed to us here that makes sense. And from all this, I see that God in the beginning, and I'm going to summarize it with this. God in the beginning was completely monotheistically one in being and in person. He spoke 
He had spirit. He was a consuming fire. There was none of this Father, Son, Holy Spirit in the beginning stuff that the Trinitarians want to impose upon us. Uh, and then he became a Trinitarian of sorts when, when he manifested himself in his son, a human being. And then he sent his Holy Spirit to be with those who believed on his son, a separate manifestation of himself, the consuming fire in heaven. And then it was all on Jesus. The fullness of the God had dwelling in him bodily. The fullness of the God had dwelling in him bodily. That's what it came down to that point. And then we read in 1 Corinthians, Jesus gives it all back to his father so that his father, God, can be all in all. And um, there's a Greek word. It comes from another Greek word called phaino. It's phanian. And phaino means to cause to appear, to bring to light, to show, to uncover, to reveal, to make known, to disclose, to uh, expound, to shine, to give light, to come into being, to come about. And to me, that's the best description overall of God and his makeup in scripture. God is a Thano. He is not only monotheistic, not only Trinitarian, not only modalistic, but he reveals, he shines forth, he discloses to people. He is a Thano relative to the age. So if someone says, what is your idea of God? I would say he is, uh, uh, he is a phano relative to the age. What does that mean? I would say he's dialectically uh, revealing himself based on the age that he has interacting with human beings. What? You don't I don't believe anything but the fact that he cannot be nailed down and he cannot be tied down by anything, even Phano, except Phano is so, so sort of obtuse that it's just like he reveals, right? And on this, I am finally at rest. I am at peace with it. You can disagree. You can send me your books and literature on the Trinity and all the, you can bring James White back and Matt Slick and, and all the other guys who want to insist that we got to go with creedal definition. But I am convinced that uh, he is not a singular static in the sense of uh, Parmenides, but he is in a state of beautiful, perfect, truthful flux. And it's all dependent on where we are as human beings when it comes to understanding him. Okay, I promised to get to your comments from nearly two weeks ago. I'm gonna go quick. Now I just gotta tell you guys, some of you guys write long things. And I can't cover the real long ones. You give scriptures, you want, uh, you want me to answer. And so I want you to know, I answer your questions through the presentations I do. And if they don't touch on them specifically, that's what I believe is in the presentations. How your passages to try to question me, uh, you're gonna have to kind of figure it out as we go. But um, we're gonna start with MH. He's particularly long-winded. He says, I was looking more at this topic this past weekend and I found a lecture by a guy named Michael Heiser. Of course, Michael Heiser talks about the Trinity revealing himself in the uh, Jewish uh, writings. And I've read some of Michael Heiser and I think he has a view and it, it, it's, it's one that's his. And I'm not saying that Heiser doesn't have value or merit, but it's one view and I don't think it holds all the water possible. And that's the best thing I can say about Heiser to my brother, M.H. Itty bitty piggy story time says religion changes, morphs, evolves. That's funny. I haven't even read these. Evolves more, always has, always will. This is right in harmony with what we're talking about. It does so right in the Bible to Old and New Testament. Religious evolution is why endless religions and sects and Christianity develop and why some are strident, even violently trying to prevent evolution through declarations while still evolving. I didn't read your comments. I, I see the mass of them and I put them on the paper, but that's exactly what I just said. And I agree with you completely, itty bitty piggy story time. And uh, good comment. Stephanie. I want to answer your comment the best I can. She says, I get confused when I read the first chapter of Hebrews NLT version, specifically verse two. 
Now it says, in past times God uh, spoke to us by his prophets, but in these days he speaks to us by his son. And then verse two says, and now in these final days, he's spoken to us through his son. God promised everything through the son as an inheritance. And through the son, he created the universe. And so her question, see, so when you read that passage in, in Hebrews and the writer of Hebrews is talking about how God created everything through his son, Stephanie's natural question is, doesn't that prove there was a son that God the Father created everything through at the beginning? No. Remember, Stephanie, when the writer of Hebrews wrote, Jesus has already been to earth. He's already taken on a body. He's already lived his life, died and resurrected and was known as the son of God. So when the writer of Hebrews wrote, he's thinking of that Jesus and he's describing him in the way that they understood that Jesus as the son. You see, but he's not he's not giving credence that Jesus was in a pre-incarnate state in the Old Testament uh, and before the Old Testament, creating the world for his father, God. It's just the language that they use. So it's like, um, I could say, Jeff is the oldest, Jeff was the oldest, Jeff is the oldest son in my parents' family. Um, but Jeff died. Now I'm the oldest son in my parents' family. He really did die, and so Jeff is no longer the oldest. But I refer to him as Jeff because he existed. If Jeff had not been born to my parents, I could never refer to him by a name. So if Jeff, let's say, uh, was, uh, 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 died in my mom before he was ever born, we could say what was in my mother's stomach would have been the oldest son in the family, but we wouldn't have a name for that child. But because Jeff took on flesh and was given a name, when we speak about him today, we refer to him by that name, even though he's gone. And that's the same thing when it comes to scripture. The writers of scripture speak of Jesus, the word made flesh by his given earthly name. But it doesn't mean it was Jesus in the beginning doing those things. What created the world? We have it. It tells us in the Old Testament, God spoke. God said, and the, and the thing happened. God said, let there be light, and there was light. God spoke words, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, but not Jesus. I know it's a long explanation. You ask a few other questions, but uh, too long and too deep to get into. And so just keep studying and keep challenging. Don't believe me. Uh, believe the spirit and what you're reading. And if you glom on to an element of of, of, of scripture that supports something that resonates to your heart, like Jesus has always been, Stephanie, go with it. Go with it. Don't care about what I say or anyone else. You go with it until proven otherwise. And that's how the spirit works. You go with what you know and believe. And then as the spirit works on you, you, you are released from those former prejudices and you go on to something else. Madison Kuhn says, I choose to trust. She cites uh, the nine minute mark in the show of last week. Jack Dawson said, with all great content lately, Sean, I'm curious if you will ever see, if I've ever seen the documentary, Jesus Camp. Uh, if you have seen it or eventually watch it, I'd love at some point to hear your thoughts on it. Or if you already have commented on that, tell me where it's at. Uh, I've seen Jesus Camp makes me, and it made me sick. It makes me sick. And uh, I would, I would uh, die if my grandsons were sent to Jesus camp or my daughters were sent to Jesus camp. And I think some of them went to some Jesus camp type things to tell you the truth. I think that when adults um, fabricate spiritual experiences for children to have, it's really unfortunate. And I know child is a Christian until they choose to receive what God is giving them. That's when they become a Christian. Until that time, they're in our care to love and, and guide and help, but they become a Christian on their own. There's no, there's no grandchildren in heaven, as they say. Dean Metcalf uh, said, great presentation on the subject. This is speaking about two weeks ago. Simple logical sense to balance Rome in addition to previous fighting with people who want to take the faith and turn it into a mystery school, which diverts away from the key points taught by Jesus and to pass on to selected individuals to publish. Thank you, Dean Metcalf. 
Damn 2012 says, since idolaters believe that God equals one person, idolaters believe that God is one person. <laughs> he, this guy is so full of loaded language. John 1.1 1, 1 is clear that the word is God. Can idolaters explain how the word isn't a person prior to incarnation? And more to the point, can idolaters explain how Jesus isn't the incarnate father? Um, no, I can't explain any of it. I, I, all I can tell you is um, I read John 1.1. 1, 1, it says the word of God was made flesh. The word was made flesh. The word was with God in the beginning. The word was God. I believe that. I say, but it doesn't say Jesus was with God and Jesus is God. It says the word, logos, for a reason. So I'm going to stick with that damn and J7 T8, I think we need to remember that the New Testament was written entirely in Greek by Greek-speaking believer Gentiles. Logos word in John 1.1 1, 1 doesn't hold the same exact meaning as Old Testament theology or modern English assumptions. It's a philosophical Greek descriptor. It basically means divine reason and is actually the root word of the English word logic. Lo logos, log logos, logic, right. Not word meaning speech and writing. Uh, see, and, and that I would differ with you because uh, you can see logos used. You can see uh, graph, grapho throughout the New Testament for writing, but you can also see logos used. I do agree with you completely that the logos, the word uh, was with God and the word was God, is far more than just the speaking of God. But what the way to understand that in my estimation is that when God speaks, maybe unlike me, who's a blabbermouth, but when God speaks, those words, one, we know are eternal. Two, we know they can never go void. Three, they can never be proven untrue. And four, they, they represent his mind, his heart, his, his desire, his omniscience and omnipresence and and, and all the factors about him. That's why logos does mean his, his logic. It's such a big word that the Greeks used. And John purposely used logos because it represents the full mind will of God when he speaks and, and, and therefore that became flesh. So I agree with you in the sense that this doesn't mean, hey, words. But God's words are representational of his whole person, is what I'm saying. He doesn't, he's not a rapper. He doesn't just come up with rhyming things. When he says something, that incorporates all attributes of God, which John kind of threw in as the logos. Okay, then from last week's show, David Pollock says, Hi, Sean, I enjoyed watching again. I appreciate your respectful tone when referencing me and the questions I had regarding the scriptures. I offered to support some of the reasons I think the Trinity is biblical. I wish we could verbally dialogue, but I know you're a busy guy. While you haven't yet changed my perspective on these passages, you definitely gave me some things to think about, and I appreciate that. I hope we're all thinking. That, that's the point, really. My point is not to make you believe like I do. Honest to God, because I believe things that are wrong. My point is to get the dialogue going and to treat each other well amidst the dialogue. For David, for you to love me and receive me as a brother without the little qualifications either. I get those all the time. Sean, you know, I, I still see you as a brother uh, in light of all your heretical views. You know, come on. That, I mean, how would you like to be qualified every time someone uh, saw you? Hey, Bill, I, I really see you as a Christian, even though, you know, you're so full of problems and sin. And, and I mean, what good does that do? What do we benefit by telling somebody, I still view you as okay, even the, why do we have to add those qualifiers? I love you. You, you claim Christ. I, I respect you as a Christian. You see the Trinity, whatever. We're all good. We can't do that, can we? That's what I'm trying to do. Get us to think in dialogue. I reveal the stuff I believe. You reveal the stuff you believe. And let's love each other in Jesus' name. And let him beat the one who's all messed up with a few stripes after this life. But let's let the rest of it settle. If that hasn't come through as the purpose for heart of the matter, we have a problem. Because we have to uh, start letting the theological differences die. I got a book in the mail today. It was called Doctrinal. Did you read it? 
I'm asking my, my youngest daughter here. It's something about like doctrinal certitudes or, or something like that. Or I, I can't remember. I'll talk about it next week. I'll bring it. And it's like the title alone makes me want to throw up. Because it, it's like a, a, uh, a manual for creating another sect. We have to realize we're going to see things differently. Anyway, thank you, David. Uh, Madison said at 755, there's a powerful thought. Shamo Krasinski says, I learned something new today. The Johannine comma. Thank you, Sean. Yeah, thank you for checking that out. My magic man 21 says, also, Sean, I can see how Jesus says my father does the works in the words you hear are not mine, but he who sent me to me. He's talking about himself as the father. But through the son in the form of a man, the father dwelt among his people, no one else. Okay, there's another view. And uh, if that's the view, okay, let's take it, run with it and see where it goes. We're going to skip JT T8 because... Um, he likes how good natured I am, but yeah, I'm sorry, you guys, I'm going to skip that. Ramon Cruz says, I think the collection of ancient Jewish writings called the Bible is a unified story that leads us to Jesus, not to God directly. Since we cannot directly relate to God, Yahweh, any more, the more we understand who Jesus is, the more we may understand who God is. I love that because that's why Jesus came. He came to deliver the word made flesh, describe who God is. So when we look to Jesus, we know what the character of God is because that Old Testament God, he burns you up if you try to get to know him, right? He's a consuming fire. And he says, let us see truths of the Bible through spiritual lenses and grow in it. Let his spirit reign. But then, then um, Ramon does something unique. It's really funny. I don't know why he did this, but he added, quote, our thoughts, opinions, doctrines, tradition, and feelings are all obstacles to the truth, end quote. And the person who said that is a guy named Daryl Scott. He quoted Daryl Scott in his comment at the bottom of a video, and Daryl Scott happens to be a friend of mine. And, and Daryl Scott is, is, is someone who lost his uh, daughter. She was the first one shot and killed at Columbine. And Daryl was a pastor. He, he believes the church is completely gone now, that there's not much value in religion at all because of what the churches have done to it. And so he's citing Daryl, who said, our thoughts, opinions, doctrines, tradition, and feelings are all obstacles to the truth. And I think that's really great because Daryl's a great guy, and I like the way he thinks. Um, C. Whitener, Curtis wrote, thank you very much for introducing me to the uh, comma Johannium. Uh, I have already inserted a footnote into my Bible. It seems very credible, and my NLT excluded the fact that it was used in only later texts. Thank you. And thank you for checking it out and including it in your Bible, Curtis. Seekers of truth, I love you. And that's what it's about. People who want to know and are willing to seek and challenge their prejudices, right? People of the free gift wrote, we need to get something that's more absorbent. These things are discovering my face in a coat of particles. People of the free gift say, if Jesus was God's word become flesh, how is God speaking from heavens at Jesus, baptism, transfiguration? How can Jesus say, I only do what the Father tells me to do? Uh, and that's biblical literalism. You know, if Jesus is God's word made flesh, does it mean God doesn't have any more words? He's a mute. He gave <laughs> all of God's words, became flesh and dwelt among us. So therefore God's like, <gasps> <laughs> uh, what I was saying there with my sign language was Jesus talk, Jesus talk. Um, and I get why we think like that, but I don't think it works that way. People of the free gift. Uh, people of the free gift also write, if God is spirit according to Jesus and the Holy Spirit is God's spirit, then how is the Holy Spirit distinct from the Father according to Sean's view? Uh, I don't think the Holy Spirit is distinct from the Father. I think the Holy Spirit is God, the Father. I think the Holy Spirit is his spirit. What I do think is distinct from the Father is the Comforter, which we're going to talk about Monday night if you tune in. That's when we're going to talk about three spirits that I see in Scripture that 
operate this world in and among human beings? So it's a great question to lead into. And then Joseph Smith wrote, I love and I don't, I love and I don't need Christ or any other invisible God. I, ha- I left faith and found love. And, you know, it's a fine, uh, fine representation if it's possible. I have a hard time believing that it's possible. And, and let me tell you why really quickly. We're out of time. Will you tell Charlie we'll take his call next week? Whoever, uh, operators, tell him we love him. Uh, Joseph, I think it's hard to extract yourself from faith and to love as God wants you to love. Here's why. Uh, Your neighbor comes over and punches your mom in the face. God says, forgive. You say, but he punched my mom in the face. Your flesh says, no, that's wrong. You don't have the capacity in your flesh, abstracted from God, to choose to forget the person who punched your mom. But if you... But if you um, believe on Jesus' words and you have faith on those words where he says, forgive seven times 70, then you have a backing to the love that you give. You have a reason for forgiving and loving the person who punched your mom. But when you extract Jesus from the mix and God from the mix, you lose the commands to do what our flesh doesn't normally want to do. And you begin to rely on your own flesh and your own wisdom and your own feelings to love people. And when that happens, we love improperly and imperfectly. That's why I think faith is so inextricably linked to our love. God says to do this, we trust and we place our faith in him saying it, and we do it. But if we've removed him, it's really hard to love the way he wants. Just my thought, you have that right to think that, but just my thought, uh, Mun Yoon and Greg Albonte said, I'd love to see you debate James White. Somebody from Heart of the Matter wrote in a very loving way, been there, done that. Now I have an idea who wrote that. <laughs> um, we, I, have, I didn't debate James White. I, d- I don't like debates. I talked with James. And when you talk with people with your open heart and you reveal, hey, James, I don't get that. It makes all the supporters of James White say, oh, he was so dumb. He just couldn't even hold a candle. I didn't find James' arguments uh, revelatory. I didn't think he brought anything uh, huge to to my uh, heart. But it was nice of him to come and to share his views and to enlighten people uh, to new things. So I don't debate, but we have been there, done that, as somebody so kindly said. Damn 2012 said, since God equals one person and the word is God, the word equals one person. That's false. You can't say that. You can't say that. You did, but you can't in terms of logic. So the word is either a separate person given the word was with God or the word is the father. No wiggle room for idolaters. He's calling me an idolater because I say I believe in the one God. And I also believe Jesus uh, was God with us. So... Uh, finally, um, relative to the show of Jesus in a burqa, Dean wrote, love this video, no pun intended. God would not be reconciling heaven and earth with some sort of factional wars, be, fiction, faction wars between everything. As you said, it would be us doing that part. And I agree. Thanks, Dan. Simply foot. Uh, really, thank you. Appreciate that. And finally, Chris C. Last one says, because God writes truth on our hearts, he sees the truth in our hearts. When we let it in and when we let it in shows the way by how we live and the way we feel and grow. And thank you, Chris C., for those insights. We are out of comments, thank goodness, caught up. We are out of time and uh, we love you. Thanks for watching. Get through this time together. Seek the truth. Become sons and daughters. Rely on God through Christ by the Spirit uh, and let Him lead. Let Him sit on your heart and guide you through these this life that we have. He's a good God. He loves you as you are, and he will accept you and work with you no matter what. We'll see you next week here on Heart of the Matter.